Okay. Amen. Did you hear the amen? Amen. 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 Come on. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. It is great to be back with you again. And now, uh, you know, uh, I, this whole platform has had an amazing transformation. To God be the glory. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, God, and thank you for all provisions and all things. It's wonderful. Okay, you know what today is. Shalom, shalom, Shabbat shalom. It is what an exciting day. Why is it an exciting day? Because it's Vision Sunday. And Vision Sunday is always about future. Say future. So you need your Bible, your paper, pen, tablet, Samsung, iPad, whatever. Take a lot of notes. Because I want to share with you as we focus on this. Of When you talk about future, you're talking about God's calling. You're talking about God's purpose. And I'm not going to tell you a lot of stories today. Okay, but I do want to speak to our hearts. I want to speak to our hearts as family. Because when I think about vision and I think about building the church of uh, churches, I, I get excited about it. Because I believe we need to, to make an imprint and a plant for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ. But when, from the Bible, when it, it comes talking about the building of God's house, I immediately think about King David. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles Chapter 28 and verse 2. At this time, David is a, uh, has been a king for a long time. His warring days are over. And he's wanting to just honor God. And as an older uh, king, he, it says, King David rose to his feet. And he said, listen to me, my brothers and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house. Underline that. I had it in my heart to build a house a place of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God, and I made plans to build it. Now, this is a very powerful verse. And keep your eyes upon it for a few moments or, and, or keep mark it in your Bible there because we'll come back. Because every time God wants to do something big, he always begins by dealing with our heart. Even before King David wanted to build a house, a place for the covenant, the, which represented the abiding presence of God. We read in Genesis chapter 35 how uh, people were always wanting to build a, an ark. They are an altar for the Lord. They were wanting to build. People have always, I don't care if it was to our God, Jehovah, Yahweh, was it to him? Every person, every, every different God that is mentioned in, the, in Scripture, people always want to build something to represent their God. That's just something that is built in the hearts of people. They build altars to worship God, to honor God. Altars were, at that time, a place of, to present offerings to God. It was a place for, uh, as an act of worship unto the Lord. And then after the children of Israel were uh, delivered out of Egypt, you remember, the Lord told Moses, take an offering from the people. Now here they are, they just came out of slaves, from slaves, and they're coming, they're in the wilderness. The first thing God says, take an offering, take an offering. Exodus chapter 25, verses 2, and also verse 8. It says, the Israelites, tell the Israelites, bring me an offering. You are to raise an offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. And notice where is the giving coming from? Not from our head, not from our calculation, but from our heart. And then have them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. We immediately see here again this picture that after the children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt, God wanted a dwelling place where his people could worship him. Later, that was in the tabernacle, it was in the Holy of Holies, where his presence was. Ah, then the ark later, come on. You look again, Haggai chapter 1. It says, how later the word of God came chiding them because they were delaying in rebuilding the Lord's house. 
In other words, so he tells us God is happy when we do. He's not happy when we don't. Like the First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 1. I want to get some scriptures here. It declares that the, the task is great because this palatial structure is not uh, for man, but it is for God. So no matter where we look in scripture, there's two strong evidences of two things. Number one, God wants a place to meet with his people. God wants a place for worship. He wants a place where his presence can abide. Secondly, God puts a deep, passionate desire in our heart to build him a house or a dwelling place, a place to honor him. Now that means that deep inside of all of us, there is something that wants to honor God with some tangible expression. Now, I, I, in your particular age group here, I'm not sure, but it used to be you would always see young ladies with a, 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 a cross around their neck. I won't ask you how many have got them today, but uh, why? Why, do, why would we wear a cross or, or a piece of jewelry with a cross on it? What are we wanting to do? We're wanting to have a tangible expression of our faith. Amen? Are you with me? In other words, there's a, something that God puts in our heart to tangibly honor God in some way, to express that love. And it's always been from the time of the Exodus until all of the, today. Say, it's all about heart. It's all about heart. However, throughout early history, people always wanted to build something to honor their God. How much more do we now as Christians today want to honor God? And so we need to build something for him, something to honor him. And we can, uh, you know, the same is true. I know uh, people gather today, we gather in church buildings, some in hotels, some in uh, commercial buildings, some in restaurants, some, it doesn't matter the kind of building, just anything that's available, something we need, something we want a place in where we can worship God. We want a place we can honor him, something that we can say, this is where we meet our God. This is our expression. Now that demonstrates to me that it's not only that it's in God's heart, but that it's also something he has put in our heart. It is a desire in our heart that as we gather, we need a place to worship him. Now, wow, this gets more beautiful all the time. Getting too comfortable, Rizonites. You're getting too comfortable. <laughs> in other words, when we gather together, there's that cornonia, which pastor was uh, announcing about. It is a place where we can share the life of Christ with one another. It's a way where, uh, as we come together, uh, bonding, sharing, supporting one another, it will result in both individual growth in the spirit, as well as corporate and spiritual growth. As I travel to different nations, many times I ask pastors, what is your greatest need? Immediately, we need a building. That's always the first thing. Immediately, they want a building. That immediately, they, you know, in other words, they're saying we need a building. We need a focal point for identity of our God, a focal point. But in reality, it's really not just about buildings. It's about heart. Say heart. It's about having a heart filled with passion to worship and to honor God. That means you have to have a heart for God. And when we have that heart for God, three areas of our life will be impacted. Write these down. First, it's going to impact your vision. Secondly, it's going to impact your passion. And thirdly, it's going to impact your action. Because heart is about vision. If you look back in 1 Chronicles 28, 1 and 2 that we read a moment ago, it said, David stood before the people he talked about heart. He talked about vision, and he talked about action. Go back and look at those verses again. You'll find those three things there. His heart, his vision, and his action. Scripture tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. David was speaking his heart when he talked about building. I want to build a house for God. 
But I believe David saw more than a building. I believe he remembered the tabernacle. I believe that David remembered the glory cloud and the presence of God. Now, the tabernacle was gone at this time, but he remembered that presence, which was represented by the Ark of the Covenant. And that ark, he wanted to see that ark. He wanted to build a place where the ark of the covenant could be, where the abiding presence of God would be. He wasn't wanting to build something that would just be about the visitation of God's spirit. No, he wanted to build a house where the presence of God could habitate. That day and night, 24-7, God's presence was there. The place would be a dwelling place for God's presence, not just a visitation of God. Too many people pray, God, give us a visitation. I don't want a visitation. I don't want God to come and then God to leave. We want God to abide in our midst. Friends, when your heart longs for God, you will want to see his presence abide with you and not just visit you. That means, that's why those of you that are watching online, those of you that have been battling COVID, we stand against you for recovery. We break that uh, uh, a spirit of infirmity that's hit you and declare you will rise up and you will be able to be back in the house of God quickly. Amen. It will be quickly. David had a vision He could see a place worthy of God, not just any place, but a place worthy of God. That's why he said the structure would be big in his day. It's not as big as some places today, but in his day, that was a big place. He said, but it's not going to be for man. It's for our Lord. You see, anything we do for God always requires faith. And I appreciate the testimony of our brother today. You have learned the principles of God's provision and about God's economy in his testimony. Thank God for that. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 7 and verse 4, it's about Abraham. You remember how the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I'm going to give this land to you and your offsprings. To all of your offsprings, I'm going to give this land. Hello? Hello? And so Abraham did what? By faith he built an altar to God who had appeared to him. Now this was incredible because at that time Abraham was old and he had no children. And God says, I'm going to give all of this land to your children. Come on, how many of you know it takes big faith then? (laughs) Big faith to say, I'm going to thank God for the miracle that I don't have I'm going to thank God for it now and build an altar of worship unto him. By faith. He thanked God in advance for the provision. It says in verse 14, So Abraham called the place there, the Lord will provide. Hmm. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So the principle with God is this. There is always provision for the vision. And the vision is not the building. The vision is a desire to have a place to honor God. A place to expand. A place to make the power of God available to the people in the community and beyond. It's not the building, but it's the function of the building to abide, be the abiding presence of God in that community. You see, our God is a God, the Lord, who will provide by faith. You look at Solomon in Second Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 4. Solomon said, Now I am about to build a temple For the name of my Lord, my God, and I will dedicate it to him. The temple I am going to build will be great because our God is greater than all other gods, Solomon said. There is one thing that I've noticed that every successful person and every successful project that I have known of, it's always accomplished by men and women with vision and men and women of passion. They're driven with that constant perseverance that will not stop until they see the vision for the house of God become a a reality. So tell your neighbor, persevere. 
In other words, we don't give up. The passion doesn't die down until we, it fades off and we forget about it. It's a passion that continues to burn and burns and it gets brighter and brighter and stronger and stronger. You dream about it. You talk about it. You're always giving for it. You're always believing God is going to bring in the more than enough because God, we have a passion to honor you. God will bring in the more than enough. And so you're determined that because you're fought, focused on this one thing until we honor God. We are not satisfied. Picture in your mind here. How many of you, you know, if you know me long, some of you may not know me, but some of you do know me for a long time. You know why? Turn on your sanctified imagination, okay? In other words, try to picture in your mind. Here's this temple now that Solomon has dedicated. He's dedicating a magnificently completed, beautiful building. But look at those massive stones. See them in your eye. How did those massive stones get there? They didn't have the big machinery we have today. It took vision to get those massive stones there and in place. Look at those huge, giant timber trees, those cedars of Lebanon. How did they get from so far away here? And now we see them in place in this beautiful temple. It took vision and it took passion to get them from Lebanon all the way to Jerusalem. It all, yes, took work. It took persistent preparation. But the Bible says that David and Solomon were determined to build a house for the Lord, for the name of their God. They had a vision and their hearts was filled with passion. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is touching your heart today. At home, God is touching your heart today. He's speaking to our heart. This heart is not only about vision, but what did I say? It was about passion. Passion is a very powerful force in our lives. Passion will drive us to go beyond natural boundaries. When we pray harder, when we have passion, we will pray longer. <laughs> we will give over and above what we have in our accounts because we trust God to supply from his storehouse even if our storehouse is empty. You see, sure, we can worship anywhere. Uh, in my journey with Trinity, I think we worshiped in every hall, in, in many cinemas, very smelly cinemas. But uh, we, we, we were in uh, some desirable places and some undesirable places. But uh, you can worship anywhere. You can worship under a tree or on the beach. You can even stay here in Care Point. Mm. You can stay here. It's getting so comfortable, so beautiful. I love this stage now. It's beautiful. Wow. Wow, but I can't get attached to that. Come on. We, we, come on. But is that what we want? We, we're here and it's comfortable. But do we want to he stay here? Hmm. Some aren't sure they're so comfortable. <laughs> Maybe we're going to have to put a pin cushion in your seats. <laughs> Come on, you're understanding what I'm saying. It's available. It is nice and getting more beautiful all the time. Oh, devil, don't use it the wrong way. Come on. Come on. But what does he want? To stay here? To stay here does not require faith. Hello? Staying here is comfortable enough. But does comfort and easy please God? Are you with me? Are we going to grow and reach out, touch lots of people, including young people? That means we have to be filled with a sense of urgency to get on with the vision God has put into our heart. We can stay comfortable in a nice place or we can break out into a larger place. Only then can we grow. Only then can we grow and we become mature in our faith 
Because this is comfort. This required no faith. It was a gift of God. You need a bigger place to do the things you want to do and that God wants you to do what God's called you to do. You will not be able to accomplish it in this comfortable place. Even though it's beautiful and comfortable. Come on, are you hearing me? What you want to do with your vision, you have to have something that is more and can accomplish more so that you can grow and begin to touch and fulfill your vision. That means you must now have a heart and a passion to honor God. Your passion to honor God and build His house for His presence will open the windows of heaven and you will walk in by faith. Without faith, it will never accomplish. In many ways, I see RCA like Noah. Pastor said, no, uh, uh, don't be insulted that you look like Noah. I didn't say that. (laughs) You know, Noah was what? Shut up by God in the dark. But there came a time. Look at Genesis chapter 8, verses 17 through 21. It said, and after the flood ended, Noah and his family were in the ark, and God said, come out. It is time for a new season. You have been faithful in the small things. Now I'm going to give you bigger things. God was saying today, RCA, it is a new season. It's time to come out of your ark. It's time to come out and grow. It's time to expand. It is time to build an altar and a place of worship unto me. I will meet with you there. Thus, because your time of limitation is over. Now is a time for your expansion, for you to move out and to the left and to move out to the right. You will plant and you will build. Your branches will stretch out and touch the nations, hallelujah. Nations both near and far. You will bear fruit and your fruit will become a blessing to the nations. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, Lord, let it be. Let it be. Come on. The first thing Noah did in verse 20, as soon as he came off the ark, he built an altar unto God. It was a place of acknowledging God's provision. At that time, everything had been wiped out by the flood. There was totally nothing that they knew of before them. They had to step out by faith and trust God. God is saying, come on, step out of your confinement. Step out into a whole new dimension of faith. Let your heart to build a house for God come now. Let it be a reality. Push it over into the finish line. Listen, to build something when there is nothing takes faith. It takes faith. And today is about Faith Sunday. Hallelujah. It's a day to express our faith in God's provision. We don't say, God, how much is in my bank account? We don't say, God, what do I expect? We say, God, you tell me how much you want me to trust you to provide. You provide it, I give it. You don't provide it, I can't give it. That's why you get have no uh, re- reminders. You see, it takes boldness to trust God for the unknown. It takes vision, it takes passion, and it takes perseverance in your faith. The more you walk in understanding God's purposes, the more you will want to honor him. And I know my God is a faithful God. And that's it. That's where the great things begin to happen. First, they happen in your mind. Then they happen in our heart. I've said many times, it's not about what you possess. You may not possess anything whatsoever materially, but you are here now, and God is speaking to you. And if it's only the widow's might that says, God, I want to honor you with that. That's all I have. Then do it. I've seen young boys say, oh, a a family had given me a bicycle. And I used that bicycle to, to go to school. But he gave his bicycle in a faith promise thing. He said, God, I'll ride the bus. I'll take it. I won't, I won't take the shortcut. I will sell my bicycle. In that. You see what it is? Because trusting God, it's not just about the building. 
But is God asking you to trust him for something that doesn't exist to make that which is not become reality? Something that he puts in your heart for your business. I'm, I'm just sensing that God has put some things for your business, in your heart, and in your career for your own life, just like for the church. And whatever it is for your own life, whether in school and it's for your exams, whether it's for your retirement, for this medical, whatever it is, it's, it, God is putting something in your heart for yourself as well as for the church. I say, think about it. I say, live it. I say, dream it. Most of all, believe it in your heart. That's passion. And for every dream, you have to have a passion so you will pursue it. With all of it. That same faith and passion to pursue for your own dream is the same faith that you need that God puts in your heart for his house. They both are the same faith. God puts it in your house. Same faith, same passion is needed. And thirdly, action. Uh, heart is about action. How many married people here? Let me see your hand. Married people? Married people. Da, da, okay. Okay, maybe about half of you or so. You know, some of you may not, maybe you're a widow or a widower right now, but you have been married. Now, did you get married without something being in your heart? Come on, you understand what I'm saying? You felt something in your heart, right? Always keep that something in your heart for your spouse, all right? But heart is about action. When you, it, you know, listen, when God puts something in your heart, it doesn't just sit there. When something is in your heart, that passion is in your heart, it becomes something that requires action. I've got to give her a call. I've got to remember her birthday. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Something's in the heart. Example, not only did David have it in his heart, but he had vision and he had passion, but so did Nehemiah. You can find it in many places. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Nehemiah said, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there for three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. You see, Nehemiah began to hear God, not just in his ears, but he began to hear God in his heart. And when he heard from God in his spirit, then God dropped passion and commitment into his heart until he resigned. And of course, we know he was in Jerusalem. When that happened, that means he had to take action upon what was in his heart. He had to leave the comfortable cup bearer's position and become a construction worker. He had to get his hands dirty. He had to step out of his comfort zone by faith. And he had to step into the unknown for God's provision. He didn't know the people would cooperate with him or not. But God put it in his heart. He had to commit not only his time, but his life. He had to take a beat down intimidated people who had lost all hope of change and were in a desperate situation. He had to take that kind of a people and instill hope for future into their spirit. And faith that would be strong enough that they did the seemingly impossible, they rebuilt the wall. Yes, during our times of building, they had attack on their character, they were mocked and criticized, and they encountered setbacks. But listen, when things like that happen, how do you persevere? When you have setbacks, how do you keep on going? When things are delayed, how do you keep the vision alive? Let me write these down, a few things. Because yes, you can pray like Joseph did. You can talk about your dream. You can share your dream with others and keep your dream alive. That's very important. In RCA, you need to always be stay committed and involved in your church activities. Those iron sharpens iron. In the cornea, uh, uplifting one another. Sharing your dreams are powerful. 
You should always pray often for the church, for the leadership of the church, because the pastoral leadership carries a very heavy load. You need to always attend the important church meetings and your leadership empowerment sessions so that you can stay updated, so you can capture the heartbeat and vision of the pastor. Mm, I understand I'm special announcements coming up next week, I heard. Mm. In other words, don't be a backbencher. Tell your neighbor, don't be a backbencher. We have to be proactive, sharing your faith at work with family members in your community. You should win people to Christ outside the church and then bring them into the church after that. Jesus said, go into the highways and the byways and bring them in. Now, when you do these things, you're demonstrating God's love. You're demonstrating your vision. A vision and it means we need the larger place. When God wants to move you, he wants to bless you with miracles. He wants to, uh, when God wants to do awesome things, it's always going to start in your heart. In your heart. Hallelujah. God brought me to Singapore. And then he told me at that time to be pastor of Trinity. And those of you who know me, they, I protested, I argued with God, and finally I gave in and said, okay, God. You see, God had to work in my spirit, but God had to also change my bad attitude. He had to change my bad attitude. Then he began to change my heart. You see, if God had not changed my heart, the miracles of Trinity would never have happened. It starts with the heart. David said, it's in my heart. Solomon said, it's in my heart. You see, I had to allow God to change my heart. Why? Because only after God could change my heart would I be willing to take action with nothing and believe God for his supply. The supply came after we stepped out, not before. You have to step out with the nothing, and then God provides the way. Otherwise, it's not faith. I sought God daily. God showed me a growing church. He placed a dream and a vision inside of me. So without anything visible, I began to thank God for the church he was going to allow us to build. I want you to do that today. God, in my mind, <laughs> I said, God, thank you for a growing church and a pace-setting church. <laughs> God, give us musicians, give us adults, give us young, young people, help us to make disciples. <laughs> oh, come on. God, this church must be a church filled with miracles, an anointed church. God's power must be present. So people can find Jesus, people's families can be restored, children can come alive in God, destinies can be fulfilled, new businesses can be birthed, people's lives can be extended. Listen, you could pray that same prayer, but after you pray the prayer, there has to be action. When you take action on your part, God steps in. I know we took out loans. And I always went, well, what about recession? What about this? So I take out a loan for 20 years or 30 years. But God's provision from nowhere came in. We pay them off in four or five years. Are you hearing me? But we had the backup there. For in case. But we paid them off. In fact, the banks got upset. You're paying it off too soon. When you love someone, hot happens. Your heart takes action. Same as here, you can't have a heart vision without passion. You can't have passion without action. It goes together. It pushes you to take action. You will action what God puts in your heart. It was said of Joshua that when he was old, the Lord spoke to him and said, Joshua, there remains very much land to be possessed. 
Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there's no perseverance, the visions never become a reality. So I could say and ask you today, how old are you? Or maybe I shouldn't ask it that way. Maybe I should, instead of asking you how old are you, which way are you looking? Are you looking forward or are you looking backward? Which way are you looking? Are there any battles still stirring within your spirit? There are mine. Are there challenges that must be met and goals yet to be reached? Hmm. Are you looking forward or are you looking backward? You see, anything God puts within you, it takes heart. You have to have passion to be lifted above yourself. I think it's time to start declaring. If you can declare this, say amen with me. Declaring, I will build a great soul winning church. Why? Because I love God. I will build a church for God because people need a church like RCA. As for me personally, I have lived possessed with an obsession to build a church strong and powerful, God glorifying church that can reach this city and make powerful disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but that passion is still in my heart. I pray God's going to download that same obsession into your heart today. It's all about heart. It's all about heart. I want you to turn on your sanctified imagination for a moment. I want you to close your eyes now. Don't go to sleep. Listen to me. (laughs) I want you you to turn on that imagination with me. As you close your eyes and think about a house for God, what can you see in the spirit? What can you see in your heart? For me, I see a big altar. (laughs) Bigger than this one here. I see a big altar filled, filled with people seeking God. In the spirit, can you see that? Can you see people weeping their way from hell to heaven? Can you see young people being broken from habits and drugs? And while they're praying, I hear praises. I hear new people getting saved. I hear people getting healed. And I hear their voices praising God. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God, thank you for a church that brings reality home to me. How is it possible? It depends upon your heart. It's all about what can you see in the Spirit. And say, God, I will persevere. I will press through. I will not give up. I am going to see that become a reality. Because God, that is transforming lives. And that's what God is on your heart. You see, your heart, your vision, your heart's passion will cause heart's action right now. With your eyes open, I want you to find that card. 